Let's take a closer look at Gradle. You probably know something about Gradle and want to learn more, or if you don't, you may know someone who's trying to enlighten you. I may even be that person. Today we're going to learn how to use Gradle, but we don't really care about learning Gradle for its own sake. We're going to dive into dependency injection, unit testing, and mocking on Android, and by doing so, become familiar with Gradle as a side effect. Are you with me? All right, then let's get started. IntelliJ IDEA comes bundled with Gradle support out of the box, so all that we need to do to create a new Gradle project is open File, New Project, and we can see that there are a number of Gradle modules that we can create. Here, we'll just select Gradle Android Module and click Next, and we'll call this a new Gradle Android Demo. Okay, and Next, and we'll set it to include a main activity, and Instead of reading through manuals and configuring build scripts and so forth, IntelliJ will take the Gradle wrapper and automatically set up the Gradle project for us. We don't need to do any configuration. It's there by convention. What IntelliJ is really doing for us here is removing the barriers to productivity and saving us time. One thing I've really noticed since I began using IntelliJ is that I spend much less time doing configuration, learning how to connect widget A to project B, or troubleshooting why dependency X isn't satisfied. I can spend that time solving my own bugs rather than someone else's. And what we'll begin to see is how much that can really improve our development workflow. Instead of reviewing a dozen Stack Overflow questions from developers who've all had the same problem, IntelliJ is wired for all the major frameworks, straight out of the box, with plugins for many more. It just works. By removing those hurdles to writing code, we can each spend more time doing the things we enjoy. Good. Now I have a new Android project, and I'm ready to start writing code. Not so fast. First, we need a little background on the Android build system, and to do so, we'll need to use Gradle. I've written a little Gradle script for us here. Let's take a step back and pretend we don't know anything about Gradle. What do these code blocks represent? Well, they're closures. If you know what a closure is, great. If not, it's basically a little method with its own namespace, which can be defined and executed sometime later on, like an anonymous inner class, or Lambda, in Java 8. Let's see how they work. Now, IntelliJ has warned me that the build script is out of sync, so in order to fetch these dependencies and get the IDE to recognize my custom endpoints, I'll need to refresh the Gradle project. I can do this by clicking Sync Now, or clicking the blue Refresh button in the Gradle plugin window. Oh, look! IntelliJ has informed me that the project's language level has changed. How considerate. Yes, I would like to reload. Thank you very much, IntelliJ. Now, while that's loading, Let's talk about the Gradle build system. Gradle has two layers, one which you declare a result, and Gradle infers the steps. Think SQL, Prolog, or maybe Jeopardy here. And a second, where you implement a procedure, go open a connection, send me a file, and Gradle goes through the motions, just like Java. In Gradle, actions in a task are procedural, and almost everything else is declarative. During a build, Gradle will initialize your project, configure the dependencies, then execute each task with the help of a DAG, or Directed Acyclic Graph. A DAG is similar to a tree, but it's more like a genealogical tree, where any node may have more than one parent, but try as you might, you won't be able to revisit a node by following the edges, right? Here a node represents our task, and an edge represents a dependency. So there's a set of source nodes, S, with no incoming edges, and a set of terminal nodes, T, with no outgoing edges, such that we can generate T, starting from S, in about the same number of steps as there are edges. And what Gradle will do is it will find the source nodes and arrange them so that when it generates the dependencies, there won't be any conflicts. And here's a graphic representation of that. So if we start with M, N, and P, then we can generate Q, O, S, R, U, Y, V, W, and then our terminal nodes, which are our explicit dependencies. This is what's known as a topological sort. Back to the implementation. Suppose we're Gradle, and we want to schedule a series of tasks. Here's the source node, and this is the target in this scope. Now, we can infer the order semantically, but how does Gradle determine the order of the tasks? Well, it uses the depends on property to inform the dependency graph. Now, Gradle tries to discourage us from defining an explicit order of execution and maintains clear boundaries between the declarative and procedural. 
but we can force a series of events by simply using this property with the left angle brackets, which denote do this task as late as possible, or do last. So let's run the fourth task and see what happens. In order to do that, I need to execute the Gradle wrapper, which is located in the parent project in IntelliJ. Once I'm in that directory, I can type Gradle W and then simply the fourth task and press enter. And we should see that it executes in the order first, second, third, fourth. Great, so you can see that the Gradle wrapper executed the first task, welcome to the app project, and that references a variable that's bound to this lexical scope from the app module. Next, it executes the second task, which references another bound variable, description, which we bound within the closure. And then finally, it executes the third and fourth tasks. Notice that since these tasks form a sequential chain, there's only one valid topological sort, so the dependency graph is isomorphic to the call graph. However, if we introduce a branch or shared dependency, the call graph is suddenly ambiguous. You can exploit Gradle's powerful rules syntax to further constrain ordering and dependency, but this is an exercise left to the viewer. So the key takeaway here is that behind all the machinery, Gradle is basically a dependency solver. A successful build is described by a group of interconnected tasks, and Gradle solves the order in which they should be executed to produce a desired goal. Here's the Java project lifecycle. Does it look familiar? Now, the Android version. You can see why they're migrating to Gradle. Let's take one more look at the build script and see if we can piece it together now. This is another closure, a handler, which configures the build script parameters. Each of these closures is passed on to a delegate and called once they're required on the execution graph. Here, before all the plugins are applied. We're using the Android plugin, and since that's not very mature yet, we'll need to use a test harness for unit testing. More on that later. You can think of each build script as a constructor for the project class. And we're just delegating these closures to helper functions available in the project API. It looks like markup, but this is intentional. Here we apply the Android plugin, and this is the groovy syntax for maps. So we're passing the map as a parameter to the apply function in the project scope. And here, this is the same repositories method that you've seen before. It accepts a closure, and we pass in Maven Central, which is a helper method in the Gradle DSL. Now, this is the entry point for the Android Gradle plugin. It's still very much in development, so I wouldn't worry too much about it right now. But it marshals all the resources and configures the parameters for a successful Android build. Finally, we have our Android test harness. And we configure this here. Basically, this plugin will allow us to run fast local unit tests on our machine for Android. Android really doesn't support test-driven development very well, so we need to use other libraries like Roboelectric and Espresso to accomplish that. And ideally, in TDD, our test will run quickly on our local machine so that we don't need to wait for results. The feedback loop is very short. Finally, we'll define our dependencies. Here, one of my dependencies uses the external Sonotype Nexus repo, so we'll need to declare that within this scope. You'll notice that there are two groups of dependencies, ones that are used for compilation and ones that are used for testing, and I've grouped them accordingly. So in the compilation phase, we'll use Dagger, which is dependency injection framework, and we'll also use that in the test phase. The next important component is Roboelectric. Roboelectric intercepts calls to the SDK and will allow us to write tests that will run within the IDE, which is crucial for good testing. We're also going to exclude a bunch of unnecessary components. Finally, we'll be using two libraries, Fest, a set of assertions from the creators of Dagger, and Makito, which will allow us to write test doubles and tightly control the state of an object and the conditions surrounding our unit test. With these libraries, we can fully simulate the behavior of Java code on the device from the comfort and convenience of our favorite IDE. Gradle here performs an important function by abstracting the complexity of scheduling a build, but exposing those details when we need them we can focus on writing clean code and building rich applications with the press of a button. So, we've learned a few fundamentals of the Gradle build system and how to get started writing your own Gradle scripts. In the next module, we'll go over how to write powerful tests for Android using these libraries and how test-driven development can be fun and easy with IntelliJ.